Great. Thank you very much, uh, Susan, for setting everything up. And I'm absolutely delighted to introduce to all of you Dr. Richard Riley. It's uh, 9 p.m. right now in the UK. And uh, so really appreciate him taking the time to join us. Uh, I'm happy to see that we have as many as 58 people signed up right now to listen to you, Richard. And uh, okay, 58 minus three. Uh, but, uh, uh, I, I see amongst uh, them many of my colleagues. Uh, uh, I see Nicole and Benjamin on the screen. I know Kaberi had joined in. So I'm really happy to see all of you here for our first uh, biostatistics presentation of this new series. And uh, Richard is a great person to get us started uh, with this uh, series of seminars. He's known for his uh, teaching work and his research work from the University of Kiel. Uh, he's a prolific writer and he contributes regularly in the areas of multivariate meta-analysis, IPD meta-analysis, and prediction modeling. Uh, he's uh, known for some of the uh, special workshops that he organizes during the summers, a summer school, uh, together with a lot of people who I see are acknowledged here on his first slide. And I'll let him elaborate on that. Uh, he's also very popular in the Twitterverse. He's... Um, uh, I know recently launched a website that uh, is going to be very useful to anybody interested in prognosis research and prediction modeling. Um, I'd just like to say a few words about what motivated me to invite Richard here. So I've met him at a few MemTab conferences, which I highly recommend to anybody um, as a nice small conference focused on uh, prediction modeling and prognosis research. And um, uh, what I've uh, noticed uh, following the work coming out of this group is that they're addressing questions that I think are highly relevant to all of us. And uh, I'll just take a small anecdote. Um, one of our colleagues uh, from the core, uh, a very well-known and respected researcher approached me just last year. Uh, she'd carefully gathered data on some 200 patients. Uh, blood draws were, uh, you know, carried out on each of those uh, pregnant women multiple times in a longitudinal design. And at the end of it, 14 out of the 200 women had developed preeclampsia. And uh, now what, would, what they would really like to do, these researchers working on this database, is to take some 50 odd variables they've measured on the 200 women and then use it to predict, uh, develop a prediction model. Uh, and, you know, when I noticed that they've just got 14 events at the end of this, I really am, I mean, I'm not sure what to say, but this is something that I encountered time and again. And uh, I believe R Richard's now going to share with us some practical suggestions as to how to handle these kinds of problems. So over to you, Richard. Oh, thanks so much. Thanks, Nandini. Um, it's a real privilege to be asked to do this. I think one of the few benefits of, um, of the whole situation we face at the moment is that people have been asking to do more talks virtually and it's just it's a privilege to be able to do this for you. Um, I was so worried I was going to forget because it's so late at night here. <laughs> so my kids are going to bed right now so if they, if they walk past it's, they should be in bed so tell me. Um, the last time I gave a talk in Montreal was 2006 I think uh, at the International Biometrics Conference so um, 14 years ago. Hopefully next time it can be in person. But today I'm going to talk about um, prognosis research and some areas that we've talked about how we can try and improve prognosis research, in particular sample size calculations and um, estimation of treatment effect modifiers. I've got many collaborators who have contributed to some of the work that I'm talking about today, which I can't mention them all, but you can see some of them listed, listed there. And it's certainly not just, um, just all about me and my work. It's, it's a collaborative, big collaborative effort, this. So I'm going to sort of have three parts. The first part is to introduce the progress framework, which um, people in the UK are more familiar with, but people outside the UK perhaps not. This is a framework to try and improve prognosis research. Um, and then the main part of the talk is to talk about newer proposals for sample size calculations for prediction model development, as Nandini uh, mentioned. And then the last part, a much shorter part, I just want to talk about some of my work in IPD meta-analysis and why that's important in, in this context as well. Okay, 
So I'd like to predict that this talk's going to go well. Hopefully it will. But really, I never make predictions and I never will. That's a quote that's been attributed to so many different people over the years. Lots of footballers indeed, but it's, it's a contradiction, of course. But let's see how we, uh, let's see how we go. On. So a bit of background about prognosis research. What is prognosis research? So in healthcare, the term prognosis relates to future outcomes in individuals with a disease or a health condition, some clinical um, thing that's happening to them that warrants uh, potential care, treatment, monitoring, things like that. So there's a given start point and we're looking to think about the future. So in those patients, in those individuals with that start point, what are the likely endpoints? What are the likely outcomes? What's the risk of them occurring? And if we can understand that, we can summarize that, we can understand the factors that are causing it perhaps, and then we can predict reliably those outcomes, then the ideal, of course, is that we can try and improve health and reduce the risk of those outcomes occurring in the first place, therefore informing clinical practice and making a positive impact. This is a, I love this quote, this is a quote uh, attributed to Galen in the second century AD, as quoted by Porter uh, in, in their book. Uh, and it says, patient trust was essential in the healing process. It could be won by a punctilious bedside manner, by meticulous explanation, and by mastery of prognosis, an art demanding experience, observation, and logic. And so many researchers dabble in prognosis i think very few have mastered the art of it indeed i wouldn't say i had it's very very difficult predicting understanding the future is so difficult and hard and sadly the way that we're doing it at the moment i think is often very wrong and poor and because of that um, a few of us got together to try and improve the standards of prognosis research at least just start with a framework that we can use to um, lay the foundations for doing things better. And this ended up being called the Progress Framework. And this was initiated with myself, Harry Hemingway at UCL, and of course, Professor Doug Altman, who's sadly no longer with us, but who was fundamental to highlighting and pushing forward um, prognosis research and highlighting the problems and helping to push it forward. And we do miss him. But a lot of what I'm talking about today is really in dedication to him and what he stood for. So the group um, eventually published four articles in the BMJ and PLOS Medicine and outlined these four themes of prognosis research. Now they're not distinct, but I think they're helpful to try and give a structure because um, many researchers get confused in terms of what they're doing in terms of prognosis research and where they fit on this pathway. So let's just go through some of these things now. You'll notice I've got a little icon there, a book that we produced last year Again, that was dedicated to Doug and, and extends the progress framework. So progress one is just summarizing the average, the overall prognosis in the population. So in, in people with a given condition, on this slide it's patients with breast cancer, what's the typical prognosis on average? And this is of course in the context of current care. How are people doing on average in individuals with this particular clinical condition? So we can see here is a slide from Cancer Research UK, in, in Iceland, 95% of individuals surviving five years. Down to the bottom, Czech Republic, about 70% are. So it helps us just to give an overall summary of how we're doing as a country or as a region or, or wherever we're looking at. Um, and it motivates further inquiry. So why is Iceland doing well? Why is Czech Republic not doing as well? It could be for many reasons. There might be different standards of care, but it could also be that, you know, the different types of patients coming in at different times, different lead times and things like that. So we can start to look at the problem. And if, if prognosis is really bad, then it says we need, we need to understand and do better in this area. So that's sort of a population level. And then we move on to prognostic factor research. So this is where we start to break down the overall prognosis into subgroups, if you like, or different levels. So a prognostic factor is something that is associated with changes in the risk of an outcome occurring. So on this slide, again, breast cancer patients, we've got a Kaplan-Meier curve, we've got three groups. This is grade one, grade two, grade three breast cancer patients. So grade is a prognostic factor because the different levels of grade distinguish individuals with different average overall prognoses. 
So we're breaking down the average prognosis into more refined information for individuals. And this is the sort of the holy grail where we want to get to is individual level prediction. But it's so important not to forget this stage because if we understand the prognostic factors, we can eventually refine individual prognosis much better than if we just jump straight into making predictions and we haven't thought about the variables that are prognostic and don't have any reliable evidence. So my main focus today is prediction. So individualized prediction, I mean. So this is where we have got multivariable models. So we're, we're talking about statistical equations that include multiple prognostic factors or more broadly, multiple predictors. Um, so these multiple predictors act in combination and allow us to then predict the risk, the probability of a future outcome occurring by a particular time point. So often they're regression based models, but increasingly people are interested in, of course, in machine learning methods to do this. And we want a prediction model that's uh, transparent. We know the equation, we know what the components are. We want it to be accurate. We want to be accurate in new, new people that we apply it to in the context and the care and the target populations of interest. And we want to be able to use it to make a difference. Otherwise, what's the point? What's the point in it? So shared decision-making, maybe even to help decide who should receive particular treatments or not. And they are a hot topic. In the UK and in Europe, uh, we see these things used a lot in practice. So you, you may have heard of things like the QRIS score, the Nottingham Prognostic Index, the APGAR score. I'm sure you have maybe some of your own prediction models that are used in your particular care. Um, so they have impact. They can inform decisions. They can inform um, shared decision making. Now, this, this talk today is, is very broad, but there are some slides with equations. And here, I just want to illustrate what I'm talking about in terms of a logistic regression model. So perhaps one of the simplest models that we know. Um, so a logistic regression model is just a regression equation where the, the, the response, the function is the log odds of the outcome. So P is my probability of the outcome occurring. And then on the right-hand side, I've got what's called my linear predictor, which is just a function of the intercept, which is sort of the average risk. And then we've got um, covariates, predictors, X, one, two, and three. So this could be standard characteristics like age, BMI, family history, grade. And then of course, increasingly we're talking about biomarkers and, and more um, genetic type information being in these models. And the betas of course, give me my predictor effects. So the uh, log odds ratios in this example. The key thing is once we've got this equation, we can convert it back to uh, predict or give an estimate of uh, the probability of the outcome occurring in new individuals. So at the bottom here, I've just taken the logistic regression equation and said, well, if you convert it back to probability scale, then for a new individual, if we know their age, their biomarker levels, their BMI, we can plug those in, apply the fitted equation in terms of the alphas and the betas, and we get a predicted probability. And it's that pr probability that's the key thing. It's an, it, almost an individualized prediction. Um, so here's a real example. This is the crash tool looking at patients who uh, were admitted to hospital with a traumatic brain injury. And behind the scenes there's a logistic regression equation, but you can't see this, it's a, it's a web app. Um, and the predictors in the model are country, age, Glasgow Coma Score, other things like pupil, pupil reactivity to light, and so for this individual who's Australian, 47 years, Glasgow coma score of nine, et cetera, the equation tells us that their risk of 14-day mortality is 14%, and their risk of unfavorable outcome at six months is about 50%. And that information could be very valuable to those that are treating that individual in terms of what treatment to give them, how closely to monitor them, what information to share with the patient and also with their um, family. So prediction model research has three main phases. I'm going to come to my sample size. Don't worry, I'm not forgotten. But three main phases. Model development, where we develop that equation. External validation, where we say, well, maybe in new patients from the same or maybe a slightly different population, does it work in those? And also the last one is uh, clinical impact. You know, if we apply it in practice, does it make a difference? Does it actually improve health outcomes? So most research at the moment focuses on model development. And uh, I've been involved in a living review that's been published in the BMJ of COVID-19 related prediction models led by Laura Winans and Martin Van Smeden. 
and there's a, there's over 150 already prediction models and most of those um, just develop the model and there's no validation and there's certainly no impact evaluation in them. Um, sadly, there's many problems. So even if we just focus on development, there's many problems. One of the areas that's a real gap is a lack of sample size calculation. So as was, as was mentioned in the introduction, people are often developing models with very few bits of data. And this is leading to problems because they don't, they don't work and they get forgotten about later. Or even worse, they may get used wrongly when they're not reliable. So this brings me on to focus on prediction model development. Um, and I did say there were four types of prognosis studies, and I'll come back to the fourth towards the end of the talk. But let's just focus on prognostic modeling and prediction modeling now um, and talk about sample size. Um, you may be aware of the tripod guidelines. So these are reporting guidelines for prediction modeling studies, and they're fantastic um, because reporting quality has always been bad in this area. So again, initiative by Doug Altman and Carl Means and Gary Collins looked at developing these guidelines for reporting. Now, when you look at the item on sample size in the explanation document, they say this, although there is a consensus on the importance of adding an ad adequate sample size for model development, how to determine what counts as adequate is not clear. So that's not particularly helpful, is it, that all these models have been developed and we don't really know what a good sample size is. So why is sample size important in this area? We know it is in other types of research, but why is it in this area? Well, we want to make sure the sample size is large enough so that our model is giving us predicted risks that are accurate. So when we apply them in new individuals, they are reliable, okay? Particularly if clinical thresholds are used, so you know, if you say the predicted risk is above 10% and then we'll treat them, you know, you make sure that predicted risk around 10% particularly um, is reliable. Many models, like I said, don't perform well in new data, and that's because they're developed with small sample sizes and people don't adjust for what's called overfitting and there's a lack of internal validation. <coughs> now, I'm not going to talk about this much, but um, it's important to remember that we shouldn't split our data. So often what people do is a single data split. So they have a data set and they say, right, let's use two thirds of it for model development and a third of it for validation. Well, it's important not to do that. Model development is very hard, data is precious. Use all that data for developing the model and use approaches such as bootstrapping, resampling methods to uh, examine the performance of that model in essentially new data from the same population. And you can check your performance, you can check the optimism, you can check the overfitting in that way. And work by Ewald Starberg in the book that I've shown there and Frank Harrell for many years has demonstrated this. Um, and it's one of those myths that, you know, just don't split your data. It's not the right thing to do in nearly every situation. Okay, so now that's out of the way. What is the issue with small sample sizes particularly? The main things are it leads to things by chance, okay? And although in traditional epidemiological settings, we talk about, well, that's not a problem because on average our estimates are unbiased. Remember what we're doing here we're just having one go at estimating a model equation. So when we estimate things, by chance, they're gonna be away from the average. And that leads to what's called overfitting, that leads to extreme predictions. It also leads to um, spurious associations. Some things will look important when they're not, some things will um, not look important when they actually are. Um, related problems are sparse data bias, where you get very strange, big odds ratios because of bias in logistic regression and small sample sizes. Another way of thinking about this is, is your calibration of your predictions in new data will not look right. So let me just demonstrate what I mean by that. Let's have a drink. So on this slide, I've got in the top left-hand corner here, what's called a calibration plot. And this is a plot of the predictive or the expected probability, which is based on the model against the observed probability in my, let's say a validation data set, so my new data set, which I'm testing the performance of the model in. And this 45 degree line is perfect calibration. The calibration slope there is one. Okay, so the expected and the, the observed predictions agree across the whole range of predicted risks. Now that is what you would see, you know, on average, if you fitted um, through the model development data set because you're fitting to that data. But when you test it in new individuals, because of the issue of overfitting, what you tend to see is on the bottom left. 
where um, you have a calibration slope that is less than one. Okay, the slope is less than one. Now this is presented on the probability scale, but on the logit scale, that would be a, a, a flat line. So you have essentially predicted risks down here of close to naught, which actually should have been around 0.2, and predicted risks at the top there of one, which should have been around 0.8. So you get what, what really is called shrinkage, that the truth is closer to the mean than uh, your model is telling you, your predictions are telling you. And so a related concept is, of course, regression to the mean. It's also known as Stein's paradox. So this is a problem because we want to minimize and address that overfitting when we develop our model. Um, and so penalization and shrinkage methods have been introduced to do this. And I am going to come to sample size, I promise, but I need to introduce this in order to get there. So penalization methods are used to address this issue of overfitting and the fact that calibration will be, will be wrong in new data unless you do something about it. So what do I mean? You may have heard of methods called the, the lasso, elastic net uh, ridge regression. So all these methods aim to produce calibrated risk predictions in new data and so introduce some penalty terms, some shrinkage into the model. Um, a very st a standard but often works well approach is to use what's called a global shrinkage factor. That's where you fit the regression model uh, using standard maximum likelihood estimation techniques. And then post estimation, you identify a shrinkage factor, for example, from bootstrapping, and then you multiply the beta coefficients by that shrinkage factor to address the overfitting. So this is, this is an example. Let's go back to the logistic regression equation. Um, so whereas before we had alpha plus beta one, x1 plus beta 2, x2 plus beta 3, x3. Now I've multiplied my betas by this s. This is my shrinkage factor, my uniform or global shrinkage factor. And so an s close to 1 would mean there's very little overfitting. Okay, so you get back to what the original equation was. Um, so how do we estimate s? So I mentioned bootstrapping, but there's actually a closed form solution for the shrinkage factor, which um, just basically means you've got an equation for it. And that's what it's at the bottom of the screen here. This is proposed by Van Howling and Lassessi. It's sometimes called a heuristic shrinkage factor. It's equal to one minus P. P is the number of predictor parameters in the model. So in this one up here, it'll be three predictor parameters, three betas, uh, divided by the likelihood ratio statistic. So the likelihood ratio statistic is obviously a measure of goodness, goodness of fit. So once you fitted your model, you would know the number of parameters in it. You would know the likelihood ratio statistic and you'd be able to work out what S was and you'd be able to address overfitting by applying the S to the equation. So that sounds neat, uh, and it is a neat solution. So what's the problem? We've addressed overfitting, right? Well, actually not. The problem is that that's an estimate of the overfitting. That's an estimate of how we should shrink our betas. So in a paper van, by Van Howlingen in 2001, he concludes that shrinkage works on the average, so it's a good thing to do because it works on average. However, it may fail in the particular unique problem in which the statistician is working. So in your personal model development data set, there's no guarantee that shrinkage will work. Okay? If you were to develop 100, then on average it would, probably would work somewhere. But in your one particular model, there's no guarantee it will work. That's because these shrinkage factors or the penalty factors and tuning parameters, as they're sometimes called, uh, they're very hard to estimate well. There's a lot of uncertainty. Let me just demonstrate this to you. So this is a paper that Gary Collins and I have got submitted. Um, what I'm plotting here is the performance of a model uh, that's developed using linear regression, it's blood pressure as an outcome, seven predictors in the model, R squared of about 50%, so pretty good model. And I've just varied the number of participants I've used to develop the model from 20 to 253. So when there's 20, my estimate of the shrinkage factor is about 0.7. When it's about 200, my estimate is about 0.95. But the crucial thing is that, um, so the crucial thing is that when the sample size is smaller, then the shrinkage you need is bigger. But also look at the uncertainty. The uncertainty around my estimate, so the confidence interval around my estimate, is very, very wide when the sample size is small. So my best estimate is 0.7, but actually the shrinkage I need could be you know, about 0.2, or it could be even the other way around, just above one. 
as the sample size increases, the uncertainty comes down and the, the, therefore the, the certainty of which we're applying our shrinkage factor is um, increasing. So when the shrinkage is around 0.9, we see that there's more stability, that the width of the confidence interval has settled down a bit and with, there's more assurance that that value is going to be correct, although there's still some uncertainty about it, but there's much less uncertainty than when the sample size was low. So we're talking about stability in new data. Okay, so when you apply your model after shrinkage, is it going to be reliable? It's only going to be reliable if you've estimated parameters well. Here's a final example um, where I've now looked at a very similar thing in terms of how the model performs in new data given different sample sizes of 100 up to 500. Now I've compared here the performance of uh, six different methods standard maximum likelihood, heuristic shrinkage, bootstrap uniform shrinkage, and then these more popular methods, the, um, uh, which one was that? That's the ridge regression, that's elastic net, and that is the lasso. So this is the performance in new data. So look at the first one. This is maximum likelihood estimation without any shrinkage. It does really bad. Calibration slope in new data is a long way from one. All these other methods, the calibration slope is much closer to one. However, again, look at the uncertainty. You know, on average, it does reasonably well, but there's so much uncertainty, not so bad with the bootstrapping one, still, still a lot of uncertainty, but not as bad. And the lasso, elastic net and ridge, they all have a lot of uncertainty. So it could be that new data, your slope is at four, which is no good to you because your predictions are not accurate. As the sample size increases, that variability comes down. And the methods tend to look reasonably similar to each other. So when we get to about 500, so that's about 250 events. So that again, that's about 10 events per variable, per predictor. We have some stability in our, um, in our performance in new data. Okay, so sample size is about making sure your models are reliably estimated and then that therefore means that in new data, it's more likely to be stable and work well. So shrinkage doesn't always work and indeed um, a paper related to the one that Gary and I have got uh, in, in, um, in submission is this really nice paper by Ben Van Kalster and colleagues and their conclusion is from their simulation studies that the results imply that shrinkage methods do not, do not solve problems associated with small sample size or low numbers of events per variable. So if you get in a situation where people are telling you, it doesn't matter about your sample size because you can just fit these methods that allow large number of predictive variables, it doesn't matter what your sample size is, it's not true, it's not true. So we need something better. So traditionally, people have talked about events per variable in this area. So this is the number of event individuals with the event divided by the number of predicted parameters considered for inclusion in the model. This is often used as a guide. I'm sure you've heard of it. It's probably one of the most famous rules of thumb in the whole uh, epidemiology field. 10 events per variable. It's based on a number of articles. One of them is by Peduzzi in 1996. Actually, the focus there was on predictor effect estimates, not on model prediction. Since then, people have looked at this in a bit more detail and some have suggested, no, 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 you only need five. Others suggested, no, no, we need about 50. Others um, have suggested, actually, there is no single e EPV rule. We can't do it. Um, and Martin Van Smeden has shown really eloquently that there is no rationale for 10 EPV or indeed any of the other rules. So we need to move beyond this. We don't need a one rule of thumb fits all situation, why would you do that? In a, in a trial, in a randomized trial, why would you always say, oh, you just need 100 patients in each group? You'd never say that, that wouldn't be a blanket rule of thumb, so you shouldn't, it shouldn't apply anywhere. So why, why have we embedded that in the prediction model field? I don't know why we've done that, but it's really bad and we need to move away from it. So <laughs> over the last three or four years, we, we have spent a lot of time trying to get our heads around how we might do things better. Um, and our proposal, which I'm going to go into, but not in too much technical detail, I must emphasize, is that we should aim for sample sizes that are tailored to your particular situation, to your clinical context in terms of your outcome risk and number of premises, uh, and make sure that you minimize overfitting because of the reasons I said to you before, is if you minimize overfitting, so your shrinkage is quite low, it's more stable in new data. 
and you estimate parameters precisely. So we published papers in Stats and Medicine and then published a, an overall summary paper in the BMJ, which is aimed for a more broader, broader audience uh, than the Stats and Medicine papers, which are quite, quite heavy. Um, and really the thing is we need multiple calculations. The three criteria we propose as our minimum to consider are firstly aim for small overfitting defined by a shrinkage factor of 0.9 or above, closer to one. So that the overfitting is about 10% or less. Overfitting can be measured on multiple scales. So we also suggest not just to look at the overfitting in terms of the linear predictor equation, but also the overfitting in terms of the model fit. So if you think about a linear regression model, the classic model fit is R squared. And you, you probably have all heard of R squared and R squared adjusted. Well, R squared adjusted is just your adjustment for optimism and overfitting. So again, we suggest to try and get a small difference between R squared and R squared adjusted. And then the final one is to make sure your data set is large enough to estimate the overall risk. You know, if your, if your data set is not large enough even to estimate the average prognosis in your, in your population, you need to walk away from that as a prediction model. You know, if you can't estimate uh, whether the risk is 20% on average, then you know, you've got no hope of developing an equation. Now, the nice thing about the approach is that we've produced closed form criteria. So you've got an actual analytical solution for each of those things. Now, as for any other sample size calculation, it depends on the user specifying certain things in advance. So one is the number of predicted parameters. So how many parameters are you thinking about including? And where do you get that from? You get that from previous models, you get that from prognostic factor research. What are things are you gonna think about putting in your model? If you've got an existing data set, of course, you may be limited. You might have already got 25 things in there. So which, are you gonna use 25? Are you gonna use 20? What is it? You need to talk, think about that in advance, not during the analysis, because you, if you start doing data dredging things, that leads to more overfitting. So you have to think about these things in advance. The next one is what S are you gonna target? And I've suggested 0.9 based on the simulations that we've just shown, because we think that in, leads to more stability. What is the overall risk in your population? No, that's something you should get some feel of from, from previous studies. And then the last one is a bit trickier, but what is the, what is the anticipated R squared for your model? So if you think of a linear regression, usually people have done previous modeling and they produced an R squared routinely in a paper. Um, for binary and um, time to event type outcomes, logistic regression and Cox regression type models, then you need to get R squared from other things. In the statistics and medicine paper, we show how to calculate it from, for example, uh, the C statistic. Okay, so you need to think about, just as in a trial, you think about well, what's my treatment effect going to be. Here, you've got to think about what's my overall fit of the model going to be. And be cautious, because the more cautious you are, the, the bigger the sample size, and the, therefore the, the more likely you are to get the right thing. I'll show you some examples in a minute. Um, this is one of my last slides with actual uh, equations on, but I just want to show you criteria one and, and how it works out quite nicely. So I showed you this before, didn't I? This is the closed form solution for the shrinkage factor. Um, and I said that the shrinkage factor is one minus the number of predicted parameters over the likelihood ratio statistic. Well, the, the trick that we used in the paper is that the likelihood ratio statistic can be written in terms of R squared and the sample size. So actually the likelihood ratio statistic um, is a function of R squared um, and N. And when you rearrange the equation, you find that therefore the sample size you need is equal to the number of predictor parameters divided by the shrinkage that you want, let's say 0.9, and it, at the function of R squared and again, the shrinkage factor. So if you've got those things, you're willing to specify those things in advance, it gives you a feeling for what the sample size needs to be in order to get, or, or get to target, I should say, a shrinkage of 0.9. Um, the last thing before a couple of examples is for a linear regression, your R squared goes to one, zero to one. So the maximum R squared may be one. That's not the case in situations uh, for binary outcomes and for time to event outcomes. So here, for example, I've shown what the maximum R squared would be. So for a logistic regression model, if the outcome proportion prevalence is 50%, then the maximum R squared is 0.75. And if your outcome proportion is 
the maximum R squared is 0.11. Now, that doesn't mean the model's rubbish. It just means that's the maximum value. So when you're specifying your R squared values, and these are, there's many different types of R squareds, but these are Cox Snell R squared values, which is the generalization of the R squared for linear regression. You need to understand what the maximum value is. Um, and if you don't know what the R squared is going to be, we suggest taking about 15 or to 20% of the maximum. Okay, so most prediction models, you know, often struggle to do better than 15% explained variation. Um, and so if your, your maximum is 0.11, then you take 15% of that as your guess of what R squared would be for your, for your new model. Now, the easiest thing about the whole thing is that Joey Ensor, who works with me at Keel, has done a fantastic job of producing a, a software package called PM Sump Size. And this automates it all for you. So there's not, you don't even have to go to those stats and medicine papers. Um, you can just go to Joey's fantastic um, help file to see what to do. So let's assume that you're in a situation where you've got a binary outcome and that the outcome proportion is 50%. So you think 50% of the people will have the outcome by the time point of interest. Um, and that based on the previous model, um, which suggested about an R squared of about 0.2, so you only take that as your conservative value. Of course, you want to improve upon that, but let's take that as a conservative value. And let's say, because the, the previous model had 20 predictors and we think we've got 10 new ones based on some novel uh, biomarkers found in the labs at McGill. So let's, let's put that up to 30. So, Putting those up to uh, putting in those values, PM sample size. We say type B that's binary, R squared 0.2, parameters 30, prevalence 0.5. Plugged in those values, within a, a second it gives the results. And these are the three criteria I've talked about. And here we see that the the criteria that gives the highest sample size and therefore is the one that we should use is criteria one in this example, which aims for that shrinkage factor of about 0.9. And so we see the EPP, events per predictor parameter, it's not variable, it's parameter, is about 20. So that's about 1,200 participants and about 600 events. So what was the rule of thumb? 10 events per variable here in this setting, that wouldn't work well. And we need about 20. Let's just change the parameters a little bit. Let's change R squared to be 0.5. So actually the model is expected to perform a lot better for, for some, for whatever reason. Um, and so it's a different setting where the performance is better because we've got maybe a stronger prognostic factors. So what happens now is that PM sample size reveals that criteria two, the one to minimize the overfitting in R squared itself, that's the one that leads to the, the highest events per parameter uh, of about nine. Okay, so it's actually slightly under 10 events per variable. So this sample size doesn't always lead you to more than 10. It, here, it's, it is about 10. So it gives you reassurance uh, that that rule would have been okay, that you don't need to use that rule. Okay. The reason why you don't need as much here is because R squared is better. And the more percentage of variation you explain, the less chance of overfitting that there actually could be. So this is the minimum required, okay? So I emphasize that quite strongly because um, we've only covered some criteria and actually you could say well if you're interested in making sure predictions are precise across subgroups as well then you need to make sure every single one of those betas in your equation is estimated precisely so i've sort of taken a global approach if you like saying you know across them all is the shrinkage going to be well estimated is the intercept going to be well estimated but each of those betas could be important to estimate precisely as well and therefore you, that will lead to more sample size. But we don't think that's realistic in most situations because it, getting let's say 20 events per variable uh, will be difficult for, for most people. But anyway, it's just to point out that you, this is the minimum. You might want more and if you can get more, get more. Don't stop at our sample size calculation, get more if you can. Um, particularly look at those strong prognostic factors that are hard to estimate, maybe because they, you know, if they're categorical, they're, some categories have very few events in them, so you need a large sample size to estimate those well. I must also point you to work by Martin, again, Martin Van Smeden, who, um, while we were working on our proposal, he produced something that's, that's very complementary, which is a sample size equation to make sure the mean squared prediction error is also small. 
Um, I'm not going to go into that here, but there's a lovely web application, a shiny app that he's produced. Um, and in our BMJ paper, we actually include that criteria alongside the other ones that I've talked about today. Um, also, you know, this is probably not the end of the story. We think it's a, it's a step forward, but, you know, this is, this, is, this is a step forward and there's always new things to do. So, you know, what about variable selection situations? The proposals I've talked about here are mainly for situations where you've said, I'm going to have, let's say, 30 parameters and I'm thinking of putting them all in. But what about situations of variable selection? It gets more complicated in that setting. But I have shown you uh, methods like the lasso and the elastic net, which allow for variable selection when you're doing the penalties. Uh, you know, they're, they're not stable unless the sample size is right. So I still think this approach is valid, even in situations where there's variable selection. So it'd be interesting to look at that uh, in the future. But it doesn't matter, does it? Because machine learning is our savior. Is that right? That's what the message I hear a lot of the time. Certainly, in uh, funders seem to be obsessed at the moment with machine learning that this can solve all our problems in uh, personalized medicine. Now, machine learning has a, has a place and, and has some potential, no doubt about it. But the reality is, um, you're going to need an even bigger sample size for machine learning than you do for, let's say, old fashioned methods like uh, logistic regression. Um, so, this is a pretty nice paper by Van der Plug in BMC Medical Research Methodology. This is their conclusion when they looked at this issue. They said that mod modern modeling techniques, such as uh, neural networks, may need over 10 times as many events per variable to achieve a stable C statistic and a small optimism than logistic regression. Okay, so when they're talking about stability again, uh, they're talking about stability again in new data. So why is that? Well, the reality is that machine learning looks at lots of different pathways and looks at lots of different terms and looks at lots of interactions. And that can be beneficial in large, large data sets where it can pick up and detect things that you might not have looked at in a statistical model. Uh, but you need a bigger sample size to do that. So for example, random, random forest may even be unstable at an APV of about 200. So my, if you're in the machine learning field, what I would say is that try and think about how many parameters you're fitting in some sense to get a feel for, you know, in, if you were to use our sample size calculation, what the situation would be. And if your data set is very, very big, then by all means, you know, machine learning may have some advantages. But, you know, the way I'm seeing it at the moment is it's used in situations where they're really, it really probably shouldn't be used. Right. So I've just got about uh, 10 slides left. This bit of the talk won't take as long. And uh, looks like we're doing okay for time. Got about, about 10 minutes, okay. So that was sample size for um, prognostic modeling and hopefully that's uh, been, been useful to you. Um, this next bit is to move on to the fourth type of prognosis study, which is predicting the response to treatment. So predicting treatment effects at the individual level. In the UK, you may have heard that we've had a lot of uh, political drama over the last uh, number of years uh, about Brexit. And one of the MPs um, uh, called Andrea Ledson uh, in December 2018 said this, and it caught my attention. Said, she said, I, I have never and I will not start predicting the future. I don't do predictions ever. And then a few hours later on the radio, she said this, I am a very strong arch Brexiteer. I genuinely believe that we have a bright future ahead of us when we leave the EU. It's very hard to stop making predictions. Everyone's doing predictions. Even politicians are making predictions when they uh, promise that they don't ever do predictions. Anyway, moving on from that. Um, predictions of treatment effects at the individual level. So here's an example of what people may think of as precision medicine, personalized medicine, stratified care, uh, this is again in breast cancer patients. This is looking at a drug called trasusumab, and it's been shown to be more effective or maybe only effective in those who have a positive HER2 receptor status. Um, so we see the treatment effects here in those that are positive, a very strong relative risk is um, about 0.4, much below one. And in those that are negative, it's closer to one and the confidence interval is quite wide, so more inconclusive. So this is also known as an interaction. There's an interaction here between the treatment effect and the marker HER2. And this is what people are desperately searching for. 
all the time what drugs will work for which people based on genetic information in, in our bodies. Now, again, there are huge problems in this, in this field. Um, and I could have given a whole talk today about the problems and it, is, it gets very depressing. And we try and focus on some, some ways forward and to do things better. But there are issues, poor reporting, again, small sample sizes, dichotomization of continuous variables drives me insane. Even here, I'm not sure that this receptor is truly, truly dichotomous. Um, and a big issue is of low power. So trials are not powered to detect these differences. Um, we, need, we need bigger sample sizes to detect things. I mean, it could be that these things do exist and we, we just can't detect them because we haven't got enough information. I think that's not the case, but certainly having more information would help us to know that. So what's the solution? The solution could be individual participant data meta-analysis. This is another area that I'm interested in very much. Um, and we've produced a paper in statistics and medicine uh, recently talking about statistically how you should do this in an IPD meta-analysis, how you should examine treatment covariate interactions. I just want to give you three examples from that paper. So what do I mean by individual participant data? I mean um, the raw data, the original source material. So here's, here's made up data um, relating to uh, let's three trials from an IPD metronomy of 10 antihypertensive trials. So we've got a row for each uh, participant in each study. We've got information about their baseline characteristics, the, the final blood pressure, what treatment group they're in, their age, their sex. We may have biomarkers. We've got individual level information. And that's if you compare that to what you'd have in a normal meta analysis, you would have the average blood pressure in a trial or the average age. Um, the the average um, uh, the, the proportion male things like that so aggregated information but here we're talking about participant level information so I did an IPD meta-analysis of those 10 trials to look at the average effect of hypertensive treatment at reducing systolic blood pressure so this is the forest plot and I'm plotting here the summary treatment effects for each of the 10 trials and this is the overall results at the bottom that on average across all these trials, um, antihypertensive treatment reduces blood pressure by about 10 millimeters of mercury compared to control. And that's as you would expect. We know that antihypertensive treatment works, reduces blood pressure. But the question next is, is that result generalizable to everyone? Okay, so does that, is that the same for males and females, let's say? So if you want to look at whether there's an association between treatment effects and uh, gender, then you'd need to look at an interaction between gender and the treatment effects. So I've used a package here called IPD Metan in Stata, which was really nicely produced by David Fisher. And here I've estimated this interaction. So the difference in the treatment effect for males compared to females, I've estimated that in every single study, then I've done a meta-analysis of those interactions. So it's a standard meta-analysis. I'm just pooling the interactions, not the overall treatment effect. And what happens when we do the meta-analysis, we get this summary results at the bottom, 0.77. So this says to us that the treatment effect for males is uh, not quite as good as it is for females because 0.77 is higher and therefore blood pressure is not reducing as much for males as compared to females. However, it's tiny, it's not clinically relevant. And also the confidence interval is very, very wide. I'll just get my mask back on. Um, it overlaps here. So there's, there's no evidence here of an interaction between males and females and the effect of antihypersensitive treatment. And even if there was, it's, it's such a small effect. So just wanted to talk about three learning points from IPD meta-analysis in this situation. So IPD meta-analysis allows us to look at interactions at the individual level and pull them like we've just done there. But people, again, do so much wrong in this area. And I just want to flag up some key things. First one, do not perform a meta-analysis for each subgroup and then compare those subgroup results. So don't do a meta-analysis for males, a meta-analysis for, for females, and then compare those results. Actually estimate the interaction in each study and then do a meta-analysis of the interaction. The reason for that is that when you do the separate analyses and then compare them, you're comparing or introducing a cross-study information. And that can lead to what's called ecological bias, aggregation bias, basically study level confounding. Think of a very extreme example. 
a comparison of the metronalysis for males and females would allow studies to be in there if they only looked at females and if they only looked at males. And that leads to problems because those studies that only looked at males may have used a higher dose of the drug or had a longer follow-up or something like that. So it introduces confounding. Whereas those studies that only have males, you can't get an interaction in those studies because um, there's no females in there. Okay. So if we do that to the hypertension example, the difference in the meta-analysis results from males and females is 1.577, which is about twice as big as the estimate from the interaction. Okay, it's not clinically meaningful here, but you can see that they're not the same. And in fact, there's a much bigger difference uh, when you do it the wrong way. The second learning point is that um, please stop dichotomizing continuous variables. I don't mean you listening to this, I just mean in general. People really must stop doing it. Um, it's biologically implausible. It loses information, throws about a third of the data away, essentially. Um, and another thing that people do is even when they include interactions as linear, uh, so continuous variables like age and baseline blood pressure and continuous biomarkers, if they assume the relationships are linear, then again, that might not be right. Uh, and we can look at nonlinear relationships through what's called a multivariate meta-analysis. So we could fit, for example, a spline function in each study, then do a meta-analysis of the spline functions to get the average interaction in the shape. So let's have a look at an example in, in the hypertension trials. We looked to see whether there was an interaction between treatment and age. And again, here I fitted a spline function in each study, then done an average of those with fixed knot positions in each study. And this is the average curve. And we see that relative to the reference group, which is here, people who are age 55 years of age, that the treatment effect seems to be not as good. This is the difference in the treatment effect. So of course, it's zero when you're looking compared to the reference group, which is 55. But as you get younger, the treatment effect difference is getting more positive. So like I said before, that's not as good. Um, and so there seems to be an interaction here, but it's non-linear. So there doesn't seem to be much going on in older patients in terms of the difference to uh, individuals aged 55. But in younger patients, the treatment doesn't seem to work as well. And that would be completely hidden if you didn't model this nonlinear relationship. And then the last one is, often people only do an IPD meta-analysis when they identify heterogeneity. Uh, so if there's heterogeneity in the overall treatment effect, they say, let's do an IPD meta-analysis because there must be some interactions. Well, that doesn't hold. The converse is also true, that actually there may be interactions even when there's no heterogeneity in the overall treatment effect. This is because heterogeneity depends on the distribution of covariates in the studies. It depends on whether interactions are linear or nonlinear. Many other factors that can mask things at the overall level. So for example, look at this uh, result. This is the effect of antihypertensive treatment on the uh, rate of cardiovascular disease. And we see that the hazard ratio is 0.74, confidence interval is all below one, strong evidence that the antihypertensive treatment reduces the rate of CVD. Now tau squared, this is my estimate of heterogeneity, is zero, I squared is zero, there's no observed heterogeneity in the overall treatment effect. But what happens when we look at an interaction between treatment and baseline systolic blood pressure? Again, I've used splines. So I've got my solid line and then my dotted lines are, are confidence interval. My reference group here is people uh, who have a baseline blood pressure of about 140. And again, we see that in those individuals where the baseline blood pressure is less than 140, the, the ratio of the treatment effects, the interaction, the ratio of the hazard ratios is positive, which suggests that the treatment's not doing as well in those individuals that have a blood pressure less than 140 compared to those that have a value 140 or above. Um, and in those that, uh, once you get to a, a uh, blood pressure of about 160, 170, the treatment effects is fairly constant, but below 160, 170, the treatment effect is definitely coming down. So it's a nonlinear relationship that there is potentially an interaction here, which is completely masked by looking at heterogeneity at the overall uh, effect level. So again, this is all about increasing power and getting your sample sizes right to look at these things. And I think if we are to go towards personalized medicine, 
then we really need to have sample sizes that are fit for purpose, uh, which is the take home message from today. So in summary, three things I hope I've got across um, to you is that the, hopefully the progress framework can be useful to you in terms of framing your prognosis research question. Most people are interested in prognostic modeling and if you're doing that, then don't be guided by 10 EPV, but think about our new approach, um, which can be more tailored to your situation. And then if you're thinking about predictors of treatment effect, do consider getting IPD from multiple studies uh, to increase your power and think about nonlinear relationships. Uh, and just one last slide, which is very self-indulgent, I know, but um, you know, while I'm here, uh, the references are there. Uh, the key thing I wanted to stress to you is these two boxes here. The last one is that we do run a number of courses at Keel, and we've had some great participants from Canada in the past at these courses. Uh, we usually run them face to face, but next year we're going to introduce them to be online. So do look out for those. Uh, but the main thing that we've done recently, as Nandini mentioned, is we've released a new website. Um, this is a companion to our book, but it's much broader than that. I really want this to be a resource for everyone working in prognosis research to be able to go and find relevant articles and get a feel for the basics of the progress framework and key literature in this area. So I'm not just citing my work on that site, whereas I am on this slide. Um, but on that site, you know, I'm talking about the broader picture about improving quality and shaping the field because it's so poor that it is very depressing and we need to initiatives to do it better. So please have a look at that website. It introduces basics and good practice and shows where training courses and gives some videos. Um, and if you've got any suggestions for things to add to it, then please let me know um, because that'd be really helpful for me. Anyway, thank you very much. I hope I've not... Um, I've not gone too long. Well, uh, thank you, Richard. Uh, uh, that was a very interesting talk, and I will uh, open the floor for questions. Uh, Can I ask a question, Nandini? Yes, yes, please, Benjamin. Yeah, go ahead. So thanks a lot. That was super informative, and uh, I'm in the process of writing a grant that aims to uh, use a or develop a predictive model that has interaction terms. So it kind of okay, <laughs> covers great. the whole scope of the time. <laughs> uh, my question is, in that context, um, where I'll probably be harmonizing data from multiple sources, um, the interaction terms, the, the, the interaction term of interest, how, can that easily be integrated into the, this method that you present for estimating um, the number of events per parameter yeah it's just that you add that to the number of parameters exactly yeah it's just another term so it's another okay. another parameter it's that straightforward yeah thanks uh, yeah um, i see a question thank you benjamin for that question uh there's a question from nicholas winters uh, which do you see it on the chat it's uh he says for the reference point of the spline using ipd data can that vary between studies or should it be fixed for all studies yeah, that's, that, that is the case, the latter. So it should be fixed for all studies. Um, if you don't do that, then you get, you get a meaningless curve where you can't relate the curve, the average curve to particular uh, values of the variable. So that is a little bit tricky. You, you, you need to look at your data in each study and say, well, um, where are the key positions where the knots would need to be? It's simple, of course, if the, if the distribution of the covariate is the same, so it's, I forget the picture, so it's like that in every single study. If you get situations like that, then the knot positions should try and be in situations where you might get um, at the ends of the distributions in each place. Um, I would try a few different knot positions just to check your answers in the end. But the alternatives are like fractional polynomials and things like that, which I think, again, would struggle in the situation um, when the distribution of the covariates changes. Because it, let's say if you were fitting a, just a quadratic term and your distribution was in different places in different studies, then that, that would be a problem. So I think that the, at least the, the spline function forces you to think about this particular issue. So there's a really nice paper by Gasparini, um, multivariate meta-analysis, it's about 2011 or 12. And he talks about this particular issue. So it's one of the references in my, um, Stats and Medicine paper on interactions here. That's a really good reference to, to go to about where the knot location should be. 
Thank you. Uh, I am going to indulge myself with one question, and that is um, that uh, uh, it, I want to refer back to the thing I began with, the anecdote I began with. And I'd like to know what to do in such a situation. I look at the equations that you presented. They rely on pro providing R squared, a guesstimate for R squared. But what if you've never ever fit an equation over here before? Uh, no. Yeah. So we talk about that in the in the papers. I mean, your example. You know, I would walk away from. You've got fourteen events. <laughs> yeah. <Okay. laughs> you need to you need to get out of there quickly. Okay. Um, it, if you. It, I mean, usually there are models. I mean, usually there are models. I mean, in most areas, there's 200, 300 models already, already out okay. there. So usually you can get it. And in the paper, we talk about how to get R squared from the C statistic, um, for okay. example, All right. or from other information. And I think I might mm -hmm. have mentioned it, but also if you truly don't know, then assuming you can work out the maximum R squared, and I would mm -hmm. take about 15% of that as a, as a first, as a very conservative guess of what your model okay. is going to be. All right. Okay. And, and I, I'd like to also link it to what you said at the beginning. That is, you need to first identify prognostic factors before you start doing prediction. Mm -hmm. And these very same models, logistic regression models, if I'm not mistaken, are what you would use to identify those prognostic factors. So, I mean, it's a bit circular, isn't it, that you, you're probably going to use lasso or elastic net to identify good prognostic factors. But then to do that, you need a sufficiently large sample size. Yeah, now I think the problem is that we've started to do prognostic factor research at the same time as we're doing prognostic modeling. Mm -hmm. So that means you've got a data set and then you say, okay, what are the factors that are prognostic? And you look at that and then you develop your model. And this, this is all a bit, you know, it's, it's moving towards data dredging to do it. So what we really should be pushing back towards is saying, actually those, like, like in a trial situation where you have different phases, that phase two, where you're doing research to identify prognostic factors, is really valuable. And funders don't see that as important, so they don't fund that as much, which is why we put on the prognostic models a lot of the time. But there are many, many prognostic factors studies done each year, and the Cochrane Prognosis Methods Group have developed guidance for doing systematic reviews of prognostic factor studies. And so we can try and look at existing evidence for what is prognostic already before the start doing our prognostic modeling study. Um, and I think that's so important. I think we're really, we're getting ourselves into problems because we're, we're searching for factors at the same time as we're developing our model. Yes. That okay. leads to instability. Thank you very much, Richard. I'd like to actually sort of officially end the seminar, but I see there are some questions. Would you mind staying in addition? I don't mind. Yeah, absolutely. I'll stay on. To and it's respond. Great. I, can, I can see lots of, names that I recognize from papers and things. So okay, great. It's uh, great. lovely to, to see them. Yeah, no, yeah, I, I'm happy I, to stay. My kids seem to have gone to sleep, so that's good. All right, yeah, because online presentation etiquette is not yet well established. <laughs> uh, so thank you so much for being available. But thank you all uh, who joined today. I really appreciate your being here and we've got some great uh, uh, presentations coming up in the rest of this virus statistics season. So I, I see Andrea's raising her hand. Yes, Andrea. Hi. I just wanted to say that I really enjoyed your presentation and I feel like we're almost in-laws now because of... Uh, I know, I know, you're, you're one of the names I spotted. And, I, know, um, I, feel, I do feel like that too. Yeah, Absolutely. and I'm sorry, I had to run off to chase my dog for a second there. I wanted to know if you had plans to develop an R package for your sample size. Oh, sorry, I forgot to say, it is in R as well. Oh, yeah. wonderful, great. Yeah, yeah. And I'm really excited about your BMJ paper, which uh, offers a simpler version. I, we do a module on prediction in my class and we already read too many papers for me to assign them the statistics and medicine paper. So I'm yeah, I mean the BMJ, the BMJ statistics notes and research methods and reporting articles, they're so important, aren't they? Yeah. I mean, they're, they're my first go-to as well, you know. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Yes. Nice yeah, to see that you. Was, that was the legacy of Doug Altman, those BMJ. Absolutely, yeah. And yes, a question from Zalalem. Do you want to speak, Zalalem? Uh, well, I'll read out his question. He says, would meta-regression be an alternative approach to subgroup meta-analysis for continuous covariates? No. So a, a meta-regression can mean different things to different people, but in the traditional sense, that's at the aggregate level again. So you're, you, what you would do there is you would be saying, what is the relationship between the 
average treat the, the overall treatment effects in trials and the um, average age in those trials. So again, that's that's an across study relationship, and that often does not reflect anything like what's going on at the patient level because of ecological bias and confounding. So um, no, it wouldn't work. And 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 just very briefly that in an IPD meta analysis. I, I showed you there what's called two-stage models, where you, you do an analysis in each trial, then pull the results from each trial. What lots of people like to do is a one-stage meta-analysis, IPD meta-analysis, which is fine, but the problem with that is then you, unless you separate out within study and across the information, you end up with interaction terms that are an amalgamation of both. And so you end up like fitting a meta-regression at the same time as you're fitting your patient-level model. And that leads to bias as well. So there's so many things that can go wrong when doing it, which is generally why I prefer a two-stage approach um, at the IPD level. I see a great question here from Kaberi, our uh, director of CORE. And she asks, is your sample size calculation method applicable for prognostic factor research as well as for individual prediction studies? Okay, that's a good question. No. Um, so the sample sizes for prognostic factor research um, if you go onto our website, um, there's a tab for prognostic factor research. And in there, we've got some links to papers about sample size that um, by Smore and um, Billy Salbri, people like that. Okay. Basically there, you're talking about sample sizes that are very similar to those for randomized trials. So the aim of a prognostic factor study is really to estimate a prognostic effect reliably. Um, Whereas in prognostic modeling, you're talking about the whole equation. So they're slightly different things. Um, so it's similar to the sample size calculations for a trial, but you need to inflate the sample size to adjust for other prognostic factors that you would include in your, um, in your equation. Okay. So, cause you're looking at the adjusted prognostic effects of a new mar marker or whatever. So, yeah, so it's, it's about the power to detect a, a hazard ratio or an odds ratio, not um, to minimize overfitting. It's on the, on the website. Again, this is, it's great asking questions like this because it makes me <laughs> feel that this website is important. So, yeah. It certainly is. I'm sure it's going to be. I'll, I have one last question, Richard, and then we'll let you go. It's from Serge. Uh, Serge, do you want to speak up or I can read your question? Uh, you can read it. It's okay. It's okay. Yeah, you, you go ahead, Serge. You're the, that's great. Okay. Uh, uh, that, that's just a, a simple question concerning the meaning of estimated risk uh, that appears in the wall presentation. Are you referring uh, to estimated probability or uh, the epidemiological definition of uh, risk, for example, relative risk and so on? Just and I'm, yeah, so I'm talking about absolute risk. Yeah, it's so probability. Ah, okay, okay. Yeah. yeah I, I thought you were talking about uh, the estimated probability when you are, were referring about the estimated risk. But it's the absolute truth. Yeah, I think I probably use probability and risk interchangeably. So I'm not talking about relative risks. Okay. Um, okay. I'll just quickly find the slide. Uh, there. So it's this. This is this oh. P, my probability is my risk. Okay. So this, this is yeah. the predicted risk or the probability okay. based on my model that an individual will have the outcome. Okay. Okay. Conditional on their, so it's a conditional probability, conditional on their the values of their covariates. Okay. Is that right? Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you. I will have a lot of uh, questions, but I will, uh, I will uh, write you an email with my questions. <laughs> it's very yes. Fun. Yeah. Yeah. That's absolutely fine. Okay. You won't get a reply tonight, but. Okay, I know, I know. <laughs> yes. thank, thank you. you very much, Richard. Yeah, uh, this thanks. pandemic, I mean, uh, you know, of course, has been very difficult in many ways, but it's been a great leveler, I think, and it's, uh, you know, suddenly made people like you so much more easily accessible to us. So, uh, th and thank you, thank you for the invitation. I'm, I'm so um, pleased so many people have been on the call, and uh, I hope to see you in person at MemTab or various conferences in the future. Thanks very much. All right, All right. good night.